Um, so uh, I, I'm going to tell a little about uh, kind of where the research is in computational mechanics, um, how this contrasts to some extent from uh, the status quo of methods. So in a sense, there's been 50 years of industrial computational mechanics, and there's a lot of rules of thumb there. Um, a portion of my research group uh, interest is reflecting on that advice and the ways in which it's no longer relevant. Um, and so part of that is going towards higher order methods and matrix free methods. So we, the, the kind of standard advice we're going to see is, uh, is outdated in a sense. So we, if you look at this figure um, and you say apply the standard advice, they're going to tell you to use a method that is roughly uh, these points. So this is an error versus degrees of freedom. What you would like is small error and small number of degrees of freedom. So you kind of want to be down in this corner. And the methods that we work on end up kind of in this realm. And uh, those methods are not in any of the standard guidelines. Um, so I, anyway, it's, a, it's kind of an interesting space. The trouble is if you use the data structures that have been prevalent for the last 50 years, you will find that the cost per degree of freedom is high for methods like this. So in effect, those move over to the left and these move over to the right. And maybe there's little benefit from uh, the methods that we're interested in. The thing is, if you use matrix-free data structures, those are the solid lines here, all of the cases get more efficient as you move to these higher order methods. And that's exactly the opposite of when you use assembled sparse matrices. So those are the dashed lines here. Um, this is running on NVIDIA GPUs using QSparse. Um, and the reason that all these dashed lines sort of peak at low efficiencies is because it, the operations are overwhelmingly memory bandwidth limited. Uh, and the sparse matrix representation is just a heavier memory footprint. And so you go slower. Uh, now, there's a lot of other pieces that I won't go into here to turn this into fast nonlinear solves for uh, like a broad range of problems. Um, but it, this is showing end-to-end -end, uh, nonlinear solves with, uh, say, tens to hundreds of millions of degrees of freedom on uh, single nodes, their GPU-equipped nodes, um, but solution time in a few seconds on these problems that um, would be considered enormous for uh, solid mechanics. Um, we observe much the same story for uh, compressible turbulent flow. And in this case, uh, adopting the data structures that we've chosen allow us to go to, say, half a second per time step when the CPU codes that are strong scaled, um, so we, CPU codes, uh, say, to get this, uh, say, around 10 seconds per time step, uh, that involves using lots of nodes. So we, I, anyway, this story translates to a lot of computational mechanics, both, uh, both fluids and structures. Now, what, what do these models have in common? Well, they're discretizations of conservation laws. So we, yeah, the variables that you solve for are a little bit different, but it, there are a lot of similarities to the equations that you need to solve. This is an area that has had lots of research over the, the past many decades. Um, so uh, there's solvers, how you kind of put those together, boundary conditions, um, material models, and I'll dive into this for a moment more. Um, these are all active areas of research. So lots of papers per year that get published on uh, on these kinds of to uh, topics, it's essential to a lot of uh, engineering workflows. So the, the, there are different people who are working on each of those different pieces. Now, okay, what do, what do I dream I do? What do my students think I do? What I actually do is an awful lot of debugging broken environments, linker errors, memory errors via email during faculty meetings. 
Um, I would like that to be a, a kind of more efficient process. I get a lot of enjoyment out of working in Rust because I largely don't have to deal with those issues. So we, we have a few libraries in this ecosystem that now have Rust bindings. One is Petsy, which is a scalable algebraic solver library. Um, I found this quote from Esteban Cooper was really insightful. Um, so compilers are error reporting tools with a code generation side gig. Petsy, well-known algebraic solver, um, I say that's a diagnostic I, I tool with the solver. Jewel, you know what's going on. <laughs> you need to <laughs> occupy yourself. Um, Libseed is a library that gives us a single source that we can get to various CPUs, NVIDIA, AMD, and actually Intel GPUs. And you don't have to recompile in order to get to those. So it, it uses some runtime kernel fusion. Um, so we, these are kind of the key pieces. These depend on other libraries. So MPI, LAPAC, sometimes other algebraic solver. Um, so here, here's kind of a peek into no, and you won't get a cookie at all today if you keep being this problem. So we've been using Enzyme. You, you saw Manuel's talk recently. Um, <laughs> so for material modeling, and a key point here, a lot of material models are defined in terms of a free energy, a yield surface dissipation potential. And using Rust with Enzyme, we can just write the free energy. We can write those scalar functionals. And we don't have to grind out lots and lots of derivatives and all the kind of representation and composition of those derivatives, which is the bulk of the code that material scientists have to write, but it's not the way they want to think about the problem. So we, the uh, kind of summing up here, the outlook. Um, so these are libraries. Uh, MPI, the RSMPI is not a library that I have uh, that I started, but I've become de facto maintainer of it. Um, it is safer than C, but it still has some safety issues. We're um, doing some research on that. Um, there are, I think, important ways that we can make that test automation better. Um, <laughs> Sorry about my problematic kids at the moment. <laughs> um, it, so Libseed has Rust bindings, but it, due to the level of GPU support right now, we don't have a way to do the kernel fusion for GPUs um, when writing the key functions, which is kind of the key physics in Rust. Um, and Petsy has rather experimental, um, there, there's a couple nits that I wanted to work out before publishing on crates.io. Um, but it, Petsy does have bindings. They are not uh, complete, but it, they cover a lot of uh, interesting functionality. Um, and then the solid mechanics that you've seen is a library called Radle, and we're working on that uh, material integration. So I, I'll go ahead and uh, close there. I don't know if uh, there's potential for questions. But anyway, thanks a lot. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot, Chad. And uh, yeah, thanks to you and your little uh, co presenters. <laughs> uh, I just want to say it's, it's super cool to see this kind of this kind of large scale computing happening in the Rust community. Uh, I'm starting a bit with chat there in Zoom, but I uh, can maybe ask one quick question on myself. So, what do you see as the biggest obstacle for this kind of HPC in Rust right now? Like, if you're going to name one thing, what's the current like, biggest obstacle? Oh, sorry, uh, you seem to be muted, Chad. Um, yeah. So I, I see it as getting all the libraries to work together. I am not a purist on the, like, my whole tool chain has to be in Rust. I know there's a lot of benefits to that, but the reality is there's a lot of ongoing research that is not moved to Rust yet. Um, and it's going to be a slow process because it's just too diverse of a community. And so my concern is is very pragmatic of all these surfaces where like there's ongoing active research um, say you know back 
back here, I identify a bunch of these. These are different communities. Um, people have different training. They have different preferences on languages. Um, we want to be able to use all that stuff without a um, excessively complicated environment. And we want to make it so people who want to, for any one of these pieces, will be able to work in Rust and get the benefits of that. 